So hello there and welcome to a brand new episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast. Now, normally we have uh, usually like a week break between episodes to discuss uh, the races and review them. But this week we thought we'd uh, have a little discussion about a few other talking points. There seems to be a lot going on in the news following Lewis Hamilton's seventh world championship triumph. And a lot of discussions have been taking place this week regarding Lewis' success. You know, is it the car or the driver? How much weighs on the other? Does Lewis Hamilton deserve a knighthood for his services to sport for Britain in particular? Um, And so many people have weighed in. So we've decided we're going to weigh in as well. So without further ado, let's begin. So as always, my name is Adam. I'm one of the hosts on this episode and join me once again, my co-host Courtney Pine. So Courtney, how are you doing this evening? Are you okay? Yeah, hello everyone. I'm doing good. Um, It's been an exciting week for the pair of us and this channel. And uh, what a better way to celebrate than to uh, tuck into a few of the subjects we're going to discuss them in a moment. Absolutely. And you're right to bring up that episode. Uh, For those of you that obviously follow us on YouTube in particular, the latest episode, episode 40, where we discuss the fallout from Lewis Hamilton's seventh world championship success has done incredibly well. It's by far our most popular video already. And it's slowly but surely reaching that magical 1000 views. Now, of course, 1000 views on YouTube for a lot of huge YouTubers would not necessarily be something to celebrate. But for us, having been doing these podcasts since February, and it's a very small channel, uh, obviously we haven't hit the 100 subscriber mark yet, but we're certainly getting closer to that. That is an absolutely huge, exciting prospect, something we didn't think we would manage to achieve um, for some time, let alone the boom that we've had in recent months and recent episodes, I should say. So for you guys out there that have tuned in so far, particularly to that episode, thank you so much. And of course, if you are watching this one, make sure to check that one out. Help us to get to 1,000 um, views, I should say. I mean, 1,000 subscribers would be lovely, but 1,000 views are probably more likely at this point. <laughs> and also to 100 subscribers as well. And uh, we hope you can help us achieve those milestones. And if you do, we might have something to interest you in in a future episode. So without further ado, Courtney, let's get into the discussion at hand. So first things first, um, in last week's episode, we discussed the Turkish Grand Prix as a review. We did elude one particular thing, and I didn't realise this until I watched the podcast back, uh, listened to the podcast back. So I do apologise for not mentioning this at the time. But I want to take your minds back to qualifying on, in Turkey on Saturday. Obviously, it was pouring down a rain, very treacherous and difficult conditions. One moment in particular that stood out for me was at the end of qualifying one, where, for those of you that remember, Nicholas Latifi had spun out and obviously required the recovery vehicle at the end of qualifying to recover his stranded car. Now, Normally, that seems like a regular incident and, you know, it doesn't take long to fix. Sometimes qualifying two, in this case, would be delayed under normal circumstances. The conditions certainly warranted that. And then after a few minutes delay, the cars would be able to go back out and then continue with qualifying. However, this did not necessarily happen. The recovery vehicle was trying to recover Latifi's car. However, whilst that was still going on, Q2 had begun very briefly and yellow flags were being waved on the circuit so that the drivers that were coming out had to go very slowly and be careful and normally you would think okay that's absolutely fine it's not the worst thing but unfortunately six years ago something very similar happened where a risk I suppose was taken in difficult conditions with a recovery vehicle on circuit in difficult conditions much worse than what we saw and unfortunately it resulted in a crash uh, that resulted in the death of Jules Bianchi. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with Jules Bianchi, Jules Bianchi was a driver for the Mauritia team. He was part of the Ferrari Young Drivers Programme, a very, very promising young talent, one of the best young French drivers that we'd seen in some time. And sadly, after the recovery vehicle was trying to recover Adrian Sutil Sauber, the conditions warranted. There were typhoon-like conditions in Japan at the time. And, you know, we were surprised that the race was even going ahead, let alone in this circumstance where if a safety car was warranted or a red flag, none of those happened. We have single waved yellows, even a green flag. I remember the footage of it was being waved in that area. And as a result, 
Jules Bianchi lost control of his car, completely aquaplaned and crashed into the recovery vehicle and as a result fell into a coma and his injuries resulted in his, uh, his death, unfortunately, which was a very, very dark black day for motorsport and Formula One in general. It was the first casualty of its kind in 20 years since we lost Ayrton Senna. And the reason why I'm going back to this particular incident is when I watched qualifying in Turkey, I did ask myself, why is Formula One allowing the cars to go around in difficult conditions when a recovery vehicle had not cleared the Williams and was still on the circuit? when this had only happened six years ago and the results were obvious. Now, thankfully this didn't happen again, but it doesn't mean to say that it could have or couldn't have happened again. And the response of this incident was Michael Massey, the race director saying, well, the clerk of the circuit did tell us that the recovery vehicle, the crane in this particular case would have been off the circuit by the time the cars got round, but it was quite obvious that this was not the case. And they were trying to chase a deadline to avoid the track getting too dark because it was a bit later in the day in Turkey. For those who remember, the race was on a lot earlier on the Sunday than qualifying on the Saturday. And, you know, the, the events transpired as they did. Thankfully, everyone was okay. No, no accidents happened or anything like that. But uh, you know, getting to the point of why this really enraged me is the fact that we lost someone as, a, you know, someone so young and so talented as Jules. Not that it would have mattered about their talent, but when Formula One takes risks in history, the history of the sport, Formula One has taken risks on certain occasions and more often than not, they do tend to get burned in the worst way possible. I mean, uh, one uh, incident that comes to memory, Nicky Lauda, and uh, the rush, the rush film really does illustrate this point of what happened in that driver briefing, that famous driver briefing in 1975 at the Nordschleife, where Nicky had addressed the rest of the drivers about the concerns of the conditions of the track, and they were less than satisfactory in general. I mean, this was a track that was almost impossible to drive in the dry. I mean, so Jackie Stewart referred to it as a green hill, and Nicky basically said to everyone, "Look, maybe we should postpone the race." And, you know, not worry, you know, we'll walk away with our lives, the way he put it. And, they, you know, they took a vote, they decided to carry on instead. And Nicky, unfortunately, had his terrible accident, which was resulted in almost losing his life then. And, you know, it was another example of Formula One taking a risk. Now, this was back in the 70s. Obviously, you know, it was a lot riskier then. Not that it makes it right. But this is 2020. Something like taking a chance on something like this does not sit well with me as a Formula One fan. And I know I appreciate it sounds like a bit of a monologue, but I was completely appalled by this and completely thankful by the fact that everything was okay. Nothing had happened. Um, well, I mean, I'll come to you for your take on this, Courtney. What did you think when you saw this? Because I was appalled. I don't know about you. Yeah, to be honest, I was completely surprised by the news when it broke. Um, mainly because, and you know, rightly so, there's been so much movement when it comes to safety, particularly after Ant Senna died in '94. And one of the latest innovations was the halo. Now, most Formula One purists, including myself at the time, were against the idea. I thought, you know what, they're ugly, they're going to ruin a part of the sport. Because for me personally, I like to see. It might sound stupid, but like with, with the helmet, it gives you a sense of the individual, the character, particularly like when you see them going through with challenging corners and stuff. It's a part of the character of the actual um, sport. And it was it was taken away. But after a while, many of us accepted, you know, this has happened for the sake of safety. Yeah, it doesn't matter how much these drivers earn or, you know, they're living a dream of many people. They deserve to be safe doing what they do in their job, effectively. So... For me, it's very surprising to see that despite us coming so far with it and, shall we say, small sacrifices have been made for the actual spectacle in order for the drivers to stay um, safe, it's shocking to see things like this happening, particularly after what happened to Joel Bianchi, which was, you know, truly tragic. Hmm. But it, it, it can't happen. I don't, I don't know if... I don't know if, if the, the Formula 1 organisers of 
fully recovered from the shock, which was um, Charlie Wyatt in the, 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 the former, um, former steward um, that passed away suddenly before the Australian Grand Prix last season, I believe. Yeah. You know, it was it was a shocking thing that yeah, it was it was shocking for everyone involved and perhaps 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 they've never really fully recovered because Charlie was in the sport for such a long time and he'd built relationships with drivers, uh team principals, you know, the very people at the top of Formula One. And and maybe the, the current stewards are still struggling to really build a rapport with the actual like teams and drivers and maybe that's why we're seeing these slight miscommunications but you know such miscommunications could be tragic for somebody absolutely uh, and this is this is exactly the hallmarks that we described on what happened in japan back in 2014 the lack of communication and sometimes the urgent des- demands f- you know from external sources um or external factors in this case to try and get races on or for things to happen which results in the worst case scenario which is loss of life in when these accidents do occur and not to belittle Michael Massey or you know the stewards in this instance but I'll be honest with you you know seeing what Charlie Whiting did for Formula One and Professor Sid Watkins you you know you were talking about who made great strides in safety especially following the death of Ayrton Senna in particular in 94 um and, you know, under Charlie Whiting, I don't know if this sort of thing would have been allowed. I think Charlie probably would have been a bit more firm and said, look, I don't care. You know, if qualifying can't be completed because of the lack of daylight or whatever, then we'll just complete it Sunday morning. I don't think anyone would have been too uh, adverse to that. But these are the sorts of decisions that when you weigh up the consequences, the ultimate risk or the ultimate loss is loss of life. Under no circumstances should racing of any kind be prioritised if the risk becomes too great. And in this uh, circumstance, it didn't look like on TV for a lot of you that probably watch this Formula One for not very long and think, oh, it's fine. They just go around. It's okay. They're all careful. But it only takes one person to make one mistake, snatch a break or lose control of their car. And they're going 100 miles an hour and they slam into that recovery vehicle. And rather than talking about the success of Lewis Hamilton, we're doing an episode talking about another tragedy. Thank goodness that's not the case. Um, I'm not saying for a second that they're not fit for this, um, but there's been a lot of scrutiny laid on them. And I just hope that they look at this incident and breathe a sigh of relief that they got away with one and make sure that they take the necessary actions to make sure this sort of thing does not happen again and they don't roll the dice because we're we're talking about 20 guys here and not just them stewards marshals and all the volunteers that go to these events to make sure they go racing are kept safe they can at the end of it can go home and talk about what a great event it was rather than mourning another another fatality in this case but um the uh rant over Um, We had to get that off because obviously we didn't mention that last week. So thanks for bearing with us through that part. Now to the uh, more positive uh, stuff in this episode. So Lewis Hamilton, seven time world champion, still, still sounds great to say that. And uh, as as a fan of the sport and a British fan to talk about someone that's achieved so much being from the same country as us, it really does sound pretty sweet. But of course, the topic of discussion shifts away a little bit from the Formula One side and the honours that perhaps need to be bestowed upon Lewis Hamilton, one of which, a tradition in this country, for those of you that don't know, we tend to reward our extremely successful elite sportsmen and women with a knighthood or a damehood in this case. And Lewis Hamilton uh, doesn't have one at this point in time. I think he's got an MBE or an OBE, um, I can't remember which one, it might be an MBE. Um, so he's already been honoured before for his successes in Formula One. But of course, the obvious question that's been raised for a fair few years now is that Lewis Hamilton has won the last few world titles is does Lewis deserve a knighthood or should he get a knighthood? So Courtney, uh, I know you've been very outspoken on this particular topic. So I'm going to let you cast your opinion on it first. Do you think Lewis Hamilton should be given a knighthood? I think considering some of the other people that have received knighthoods, nothing against them or their achievements. You know, I look at people particularly like Andy Murray, 
again, Andy Murray deserves everything that he's got because he's done great things for British tennis. But if you think about what they've achieved in their particular sports, Lewis is, again, whether people like it or not, or whether they agree or disagree, Lewis Hamilton is now statistically the best Formula One driver of all time. He's, he's set the bar, whereas with Andy Murray, he's done great things, obviously, particularly winning Wimbledon twice. It was it was a great moment for the nation because like, obviously we went a very long time about seeing a, a British player win uh, Wimbledon. So he gave us some great moments. So nothing against Andy Murray, but surely if Andy Murray's got a knighthood, then surely Lewis deserves the chance to get one as well because he's been a great pioneer and getting a little bit deep here, but the UK has a very rich engineering background. And I just feel there's a cultural connection between Formula One as, and, and us as a nation, particularly the history that we actually have. You know, the first race was at Silverstone. There's a big connection between British culture and Formula One. And it needs to be recognised when somebody does very well in a sport. And obviously the, the level that Lewis has set, you know, for many years to come, isn't going to be beaten. And it, he, he does deserve some recognition but unfortunately we're getting this the same old nonsense because it is nonsense as to why Lewis doesn't deserve a knighthood you know there's this, this old irritating story about Lewis living in Monaco and he's, he's a tax dodger blah 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 but they, they failed to seem to mention that some of the other British drivers that have been based in Monaco. There just seems to be this ongoing stigma against Lewis Hamilton. And sometimes, whether you dis whether you like or dislike somebody as a person, somebody needs to take a step back and realise what this man has achieved is simply incredible. And he does deserve some recognition for what he's done because he's really has done great things for the UK. And come on, it's been such a bad year, particularly for us in the UK. He's given us something to be proud of as a nation, and he really does. He really does deserve to be rewarded for it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of good points. And, you know, Lewis, I hear, has been tipped quite heavily to win the Sports Personality of the Year. Yeah, another award in Britain we tend to bestow to our most successful sportsmen or women uh, throughout the year not to be confused with having a personality. I, I think it's amazing. That's another excuse I see a lot, um, especially when Andy Murray was winning that award. I think he's won it three times. I think more than anyone else has. And the old argument is, oh, well, Andy doesn't have a personality. How can he win it? I'm like, right, go to the gammon section where you belong, because clearly, you know, <laughs> stupid comments like that. And do you know where that originates from? That's from that jokey. Do you remember... Not to get too sidetracked, you remember he was having a bit of banter with Tim Hemman during, I think it was the 2010 World I'm Cup. so pleased. I um, am so pleased you've mentioned this because I was going to mention this. Go yeah, ahead, please, yeah, please I think, explain uh, it. Was it 2010 or was it 2000? No, it wasn't 2010. There's the one where we went to, um, oh God, in Germany. That's right, in Germany. In it feels like forever because every single person seems to mention this thing. So it seems like it happened about 20 years ago. I can't believe it's 14 years ago. That's how old I'd feel. But this was back <laughs> in Germany 06, the World Cup. And this is when Andy Murray and Tim Hemman were still playing in women. Like Tim Hemman was on his way out and Andy Murray was just making his way as the next British star. And there was a bit of banter going on between these two. And Andy Murray, obviously, for those who don't know, is Scottish. You know, so there's a difference with British tennis and Scottish tennis. Andy Murray's British when he wins and he's Scottish when he loses. Don't know. I didn't make it up, but that's the joke. But um, he made a joke with Tim Henman about the World Cup, like having a bit of fun with England. And naturally he would. He's Scottish. Of course, he's not going to want England to do well in a World Cup. But uh, an article in The Sun basically said Andy Murray hates England or Andy Murray doesn't want England to win the World Cup. Shock horror. Andy Murray Scottish, of course, he doesn't want England to win the World Cup, but it brought on a tirade of abuse and so many people hating on Andy Murray during Wimbledon. People were booing Murray at Wimbledon, his home event, when we're like, hold on, we're meant to back the British guy here to go on and win. And that's something that's been going on for years and years and years. And it's certain intricacies like that or certain stories like that that Lewis Hamilton has faced, not necessarily directly related to that, but other things like Courtney mentioned, the you know the tax situation, the fact that he lives in Monaco or Switzerland or all the other stuff that he does. And you know, it really does get on my nerves that people use these pathetic excuses to try and knock the man on his achievements in sport. Like, you don't know Lewis as a person. You see what the media presents him, but 
the media presentation, like, for example, you know, other people that we've seen, people that we've praised to the heavens, like, as I mentioned before, Ryan Giggs, you know, before he was praised if he could do no wrong, he was amazing. And then he goes, well, I'm not going to talk about what he did, but, you know, st stuff that happened in his personal life, you think, well, this isn't a great role model. Um, but it, it, going back to the argument, should Lewis be knighted? Um, and I appreciate we got a bit sidetracked there. But um, it, as I said, as a Formula One fan, as a British fan, it does really pee me off, for lack of a better way of putting it. Trying not to swear on this. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, YouTube says, is this not made for kids? And I said, well, no, but I'm not going to swear on it anyway. But, um, you know, it, it really does annoy me when people knock someone like Lewis Hamilton based on things that they read in the press or the way that the media has portrayed this person, which clearly does not reflect his character, because I don't know Lewis. You don't know Lewis. So judge him on his sport in achievements rather Bottom than as a person. Bottom. But going back to the uh, argument, should he be knighted? Eventually, I got back there at some point, just talking on for ages. But I'm not massively a fan of knighting or bestowing knighthoods or damehoods to sportsmen and women based on sporting accolades alone as a principle. I think it kind of dilutes the significance of it. It's like, you know, when the Olympics comes around, every time someone wins a gold medal for Britain, oh yeah, it's fantastic. But all of a sudden they're given all these honors and everything else. And you think that's great. You've dedicated your life to being successful in a sport. All right, in some cases you've made a lot of money out of it. It's fantastic. You've done brilliantly well, but that's not what I call a service to a country. You know, it's success that the country can share and, in, and acknowledge and appreciate and celebrate in this case. We're all celebrating Lewis's success, but it's not my success. It's not your success. It's Lewis's success. It's not really a service. Um, but, you know, that, that, and that applies to all sports, you know, so Steve Redgrave, when he got his knighthood, as Sir Andy Murray, as Courtney already mentioned, when he won Wimbledon. You know, people saying, oh, yeah, give Andy a knighthood. And then he won the Davis Cup for Britain and won another Wimbledon. And then he got his knighthood. Yeah, OK, great. But I always think that sportsmen and women that have a platform to make changes or improve the world and use that platform for good. And Lewis Hamilton is definitely someone that's done that, particularly this year, especially for diversity and the Black Lives Matter movement and everything else that he's done. That's when I say, yes, these people deserve a knighthood or have earned some recognition for their achievements um and you know you can argue the case that lewis hamilton deserves a knighthood because you know other people in sports have been given knighthoods for achieving by contrast less than what lewis has if we're comparing sports um i mean we can talk about people like ap mccoy or phil taylor if we want to talk about the most successful british sports stars of all time but Nonetheless, you know, Lewis deserves one on that merit, but I also think he's earned one for, you know, the other things that he's done, you know, in, in, acknowledging and trying to lead the charge for diversity, being an influential character. And also let's not discount the fact that this is a young man who has brought up um, in a culture or in an environment like Formula One that has looked at the colour of his skin and not really given him the same opportunities that they perhaps would have given someone else of a, of, of a white skin. Um, and I'm not going to go into this too much, but Lewis Hamilton, despite all the setbacks, despite the attitudes of some people towards him when he came into Formula One, the impact that he has had on the sport in British sport and, you know, the lives of so many people from the same background that probably didn't believe that they could achieve what he has achieved. He is now a role model for those people and to give them that opportunity because he's done it and he's encouraging so many people in similar circumstances to take that on. And I think that's fantastic. So, you know, for all of those reasons, I do believe that Lewis now more than perhaps before should be acknowledged for that. And I do feel a knighthood would be worthy of those services. As I said, I'm not a big fan of giving sportsmen and women a knighthood for their sporting achievements alone, but I think Lewis has transcended beyond that and has been such a big influence for all the good right reasons and i think should be given one I, I don't even think it's a debate on that one um but let us know in the comments of course guys you know we do value your opinions on this a lot and we do appreciate your feedback so let us know in the comments do you think lewis hamilton should be given a knighthood in the queen's new year's honors list and uh, if not let us know why 
So um, I think this is a good opportunity actually to go to a break. We was going to discuss something else, but in part two, we're going to be having another discussion about Lewis Hamilton, this time the car versus the driver, a discussion you've been, uh, you guys have been having on social media in particular. Is it all the car that's done the work for Lewis or is the driver an element as well? So we will see you in part two of the DNF1 F1 podcast. The DNF1 F1 podcast is a brand new show that covers the latest gossip, news and events in the world of Formula One. In each episode, we discuss the hot topics, interview guests, as well as review each race from the Formula One World Championship. We upload new episodes weekly and we upload our podcast episodes on all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Google Play. We also upload video versions of every podcast episode on the DNF1 F1 Podcast YouTube channel, as well as other great content that you can check out. So make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel and click the notifications bell so you don't miss out on any new content that we produce. You can also follow and engage with us on social media. The DNF1 F1 Podcast is now active on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Thanks for tuning in. Stay safe and we'll see you in the next episode of the Dean F1 F1 podcast. So welcome back to part two of the Dean F1 F1 podcast. So in part one, Courtney, we were talking about, um, you know, should Lewis Hamilton get a knighthood? And of course, I hope you guys have put your comments below what you think of that situation or what you think should happen. Should Lewis get one or not? And uh, of course, just a cheeky plug, as we do in every episode, make sure to like, share and subscribe to us on the YouTube channel as well. We're so close to 100 subscribers, so help us get there as soon as possible. And thank you to everyone who's also subscribed already. And of course, if you're listening to us on your favourite podcasting platform, just so you know, you can watch this podcast on YouTube, the video version as well. But if you prefer to listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Podchaser, that is absolutely fine and we love you for it all the same and of course don't forget to follow us on instagram and twitter dnf1 underscore podcast and of course on facebook dnf1 f1 podcast and the same for the youtube channel as well so to come into part two of this podcast courtney we already discussed the knighthood element for lewis hamilton now we need to get into the car versus driver debate a debate that we have heard for such a long time not necessarily just about lewis hamilton michael schumacher i remember for some time was uh, definitely an element in that argument as well, particularly in his second Formula One stint in the Mercedes car, which didn't bear anywhere near the results that he achieved in the Ferrari, most notably in his first part of his career. But um, it does seem that this argument has been raised a lot with Lewis Hamilton, particularly from what I like to call the gammon community, for lack of a better way of putting them, uh, by saying, oh, well, Lewis always wins because he's got the best card, no contest. And in fairness, there is some element of truth to that statement in that Lewis Hamilton is more likely to win the races uh, that he does win because he has the best car and he's had the best car for some time. Well, that's always going to be the case when you've got the best car, but you shouldn't really be using that to knock someone like Lewis Hamilton. They don't just pick a random driver, chuck him in the best car and then think he's going to win. You're going to want the best drivers in the best cars for starters. I mean, if Lewis Hamilton wasn't what Mercedes considered to be the best driver in Formula One, he probably wouldn't be driving that car or someone else would have been driving that car. And, you know, it was Nico Rosberg as well. Michael Schumacher was in that car. You know, This is how Formula One goes. And it's the same in every single sport. I don't know why this is a thing, but when if you're the best footballer in the world, or if you're a Messi or a Ronaldo, you're going to play for the best teams. You're not going to go and play for some team like four divisions below the top division in your country and then expect them to have the same amount of success. It's the same as if you put Lewis Hamilton in a lawnmower or this, you know, hypothetically in this year's Williams or Huss. He's not going to win any races in that car because the car's not good enough to win races. And the argument we usually put to other drivers, Courtney, like Max Verstappen, for example... You know, how great would it be to see him in a Mercedes? Why? Because it's the best car. But, you know, I'm, I think people do tend to have short memories that Lewis was in a McLaren, that, yes, it was a good car, but there were periods when that car sometimes was the third best car on the grid. 
and Lewis was still winning the odd race here and then, still putting in those big performances. So, you know, before we get into this any further, Courtney, where do you stand on this debate to Lewis Hamilton? Do you think that there is a legitimate case to say that Lewis's success has predominantly come from the fact that he's driven by far the best car over the last seven years? Okay, I'm so pleased that you've mentioned the McLaren part of his career because maybe some of the younger fans or maybe some people that, you know, decide to pick and choose where Lewis has driven throughout his career, they, they seem to forget about the McLaren days. And let's take ourselves back to 2007, OK? Lewis Hamilton joined McLaren as a rookie. And alongside him, you had a two-time world champion in Fernando Alonso, who was perceived as the best drive, uh, the best drive of the grid. You know, and rightly so. He, he won in 2005 and 2006. He thrown in Michael Schumacher in the process. And yet, this guy came along, young Lewis Hamilton, rookie driver, and really pushed Alonso to the point where Alonso chose to leave uh, McLaren. I'm sure some people have opinions about what happened that season. You know, there was this idea of bias towards Lewis because he's British. You know, everyone, everyone can believe what they want to believe. But for a rookie to come in and take, you know, a challenge Fernando like that, to the point where it was so close between them, they were taking points off of, of each other. And that's why another driver in Kimi Raikkonen for another team went on to win. So immediately, Lewis has made an impact. And then you go forward to 2008, where Lewis won with the McLaren, when actually, theoretically, the Ferrari was the faster car. So already, I think in the, in the first two seasons, he's already made a few points there. And then when you look at the, the latter years, particularly when... Braun in 2009 and Red Bull were dominating. So from 2009 to 2013, when Lewis wasn't in the dominant car, Lewis was winning races and getting pole positions on tracks he had no right to. I remember there were quite a few occasions where Sebastian Vettel, the, the guy at the moment, the car of the moment, the dominant car, would be dominating in all the practice sessions and you know, dominating Q1 and Q2. And come to the final um, qualifying session, Lewis would bag a lap out of nowhere, put himself on pole. And then there would be times where you see him put in some great defensive drives and hold on to win races that he shouldn't have won. So for me, yes, you know, there have been some years at Mercedes where the car has been ridiculously dominant. And I suppose because they have been so dominant this year, there is an emphasis on that. Because it has been, I'd probably say, this season has been Lewis's easiest season, hmm. shall we say. He's got a teammate. He's got a teammate I personally believe he isn't on the level of, shall we say, like an Eco Rosberg who definitely pushed Lewis a lot more. But as you said, Adam, like Mercedes haven't kept him for this long. I, I don't know, just, just for the sake of it. Lewis is an extraordinary talent. And I just I just personally believe that Lewis won't get the credit he deserves until long gone after he retires. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I, I think the good thing is, is that Lewis is racking up all of these records. I think Lewis, I can't remember the actual number. It might be like 36 or 32nd, 37, sorry, records that Lewis actually has in Formula One, which is insane. I mean, there aren't really many left that he hasn't got. Um, I think one interesting stat about Lewis, I believe, and I might be wrong on this, so do quote me if I am, or correct me if I am, I should say is I believe Lewis Hamilton is one of the only drivers, if not the only driver in Formula One, that has won a Grand Prix in every season that he's competed. And that is no mean feat. Granted, Lewis has had a car capable of winning a race in every season he's competed in, but to still be able to do that is remarkable. I think one of the uh, and we will get to this, but one of the more memorable races, um, not necessarily one of his best wins, but one of the races which said to me that Lewis was definitely a star was back in 2013 in Hungary, in the Mercedes, the first season in Mercedes. Now, Mercedes clearly didn't win the championship this year. This was Red Bull period that was ending. Little did we know it was ending. And Mercedes were building up momentum. Rosberg and Hamilton were doing a good job getting the odd podium here there. Remember Malaysia, where... You know, Rosberg and Hamilton were battling for that podium to the point where Ross Braun had to get involved and tell Nico, um, you know, to back off and not bother Lewis while he had damage. And in the Hungarian Grand Prix, Hamilton was absolutely brilliant. He put it on pole and he went on to win the race. It was a technical circuit. 
and a track that Red Bull should have dominated. And Lewis went there with all the ability that he had and wrestled that car to get this first win for Mercedes, which proved to be the first of so many in Formula One for the Mercedes team. And, you know, you, you look at those certain situations and a lot of Lewis's greatest wins have come in scenarios where the car's been good, but Lewis has gone to that next level where very, very few drivers in the history of the sport that's competed with Lewis have been able to match. And it just baffles me that people look at what he's doing now in the Mercedes era. I mean, you're right. This year has been probably the easiest year for Lewis Hamilton. Last year wasn't too difficult for him in some respects either. He only really had to beat Bottas, who we like Valtteri and we do rate him. But compared to Lewis Hamilton, he's always going to be a number two or a wingman at best, you know, all puns aside. And, you know, Valtteri Bottas, yes, probably would, if Lewis Hamilton wasn't around, would be winning the world championship. You know, the stat, the, you know, the leaderboard is there for us to see. I just think it's ludicrous that, you can try and knock Lewis Hamilton's achievements primarily on the basis that he's had the best car. I mean, let's be real for a second. How many times have world championships been won by the top drivers that haven't been driving in the best cars? Not many. One of which Lewis Hamilton in 2008 won a championship, not in the best car, you know, in particular, and he thoroughly earned that. He already should have won a world championships in 2007, although granted, uh, you know, the saboteur, the saboteur gate, or I can't remember what they called it, the sabotage case, uh, or espionage, not a sabotage. Get my words mixed up. I need to get a thesaurus when I do these podcasts. But the espionage case with the blueprints from Ferrari um, back in 07. And, you know, Lewis Hamilton should have won the world championship that year. He'll know that he made a mistake, but it was his rookie season. And he was going toe to toe against, as you said, Courtney, the best driver on the green in Fernando Alonso, a two time world champion, a man in an alternate parallel universe making the right decisions on his career moves. We could be talking about Fernando being a seven time world champion rather than Lewis Hamilton. But obviously in this one, Lewis is the king and uh, Fernando obviously will be coming back to try and see if he can ruffle some feathers. But nonetheless, I just find it absolutely ludicrous that that which you know, we're in an era where we're seeing someone like Lewis Hamilton dominate to the degree that he is, and people are just putting it down to the car. Like, you can't just put anyone in a top car and expect them to be the best. We've seen so many good drivers, you know, your Bottas's, your Barry Kellos, your Coulthard's, your Webbers, all great drivers, even Ricardo in this regard, in a good car and not deliver. I mean, look at Max Verstappen, absolute fantastic driver. Yes, he's not arguably not had a car that's won a world championship, but there's so many big performances from Max in particular where he's done so well. And you think Lewis Hamilton couldn't do the same thing? I mean, come on. I mean, that's just ridiculous. I mean, yeah, Max is great. But if I was going to pick which one I'd have between the two of them, always going to go with Lewis on this one for the time being, at least. And um, I, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Courtney. I've gone on another one of my rants on no, this podcast. It's... Like, you know what? I'm I'm pleased. I'm I'm really pleased that you're expressing yourself the way you are because, look, we've been, we've had like a lot of banter back and forth about you know Lewis and Mercedes and Ferrari for many years, and this let me just make this clear to those of you who don't know. Adam is an avid Ferrari fan, and he's an avid Michael Schumacher fan. If you'd have put those things to, to consideration. Adam is going to be the first person who is going to criticise Lewis and try to downplay his achievements in Formula 1. Yet here he is, making some very valid points. You know, it's... For me, it's really nice to to hear somebody from, shall we say, a rival team who should, in theory, hate Lewis in his sporting sense, talk him up so much. So for me, that speaks volumes. So... I, I just hope that with time, it, it might not happen overnight, it might take years after Lewis retires. I just hope that many more people, you know, who support other teams and have their favourite drivers, or, you know, whether it be in this era or throughout time, will come to realisation that Lewis is a great. And we've mentioned this in other episodes before. Like, I've noticed there's this tiring argument out there, particularly on social media, about, oh, Lewis isn't the best of all time. Like, that is... When people have this discussion, they're not just saying, oh, he is black and white. That's why when I say it, like I stress it, he's statistically the best of all time. But I just don't get this whole thing of knocking 
um, drivers. You can appreciate drivers from different eras. Mm. But for me, I absolutely love the uh, Senna story. Like, I've, you know, looking back on what he achieved and what he'd done for the people of Brazil. And, you know, the way the way that he actually won the hearts of many people, to this day, even younger fans, they love Ayrton Senna. Mm. But just because you, like for me, for example, it's, it's obvious I'm a massive Lewis Hamilton fan, but that doesn't mean that I don't still respect Ayrton Senna. For what he did. You can, believe it or not, respect various drivers. I still respect what Michael Schumacher achieved. When I was younger, I'll, I'll be honest, I found it boring. Or maybe I sound like a hypocrite because I've been enjoying... Lewis's achievements but it doesn't mean I don't appreciate what Michael has achieved and the fact that Lewis has overtaken him statistically that doesn't take away anything from what Michael has achieved you can appreciate different drivers from different eras I mean it seems surreal to realize that that's the case but it just personifies how huge Lewis's achievements are and he's rewriting the rule book if you like or he's rewriting he's re-raising the bar if you like, for others to follow, whether these achievements will be beat. I mean, given the path that Formula One is trying to go down, they may they may never, ever get beaten. I mean, we talked about Schumacher's records seeming insurmountable. And other than Lewis Hamilton, the next person after Hamilton is Sebastian Vettel in race wins. And Vettel's on 53. I mean, that's insane. You'd almost have to double Vettel's race wins to catch Lewis Hamilton. And the same may be said for world championships as well, if Lewis carries on with the trajectory... Uh, trajectory that he is um i mean we've seen this in so many eras i mean sebastian vettel dominated for four years in the red bull you can't do that in if you're a bad driver i mean mark Webber was a very very good formula one driver and he really challenged vettel in that red bull but vettel was an elite level driver and still is he just hasn't been able to show it that often he did last weekend but you know that that's how things go and we didn't see and appreciate sebastian vettel's abilities until he drove for Ferrari, that first win in Malaysia 2015. We really got to see, this is how good Sebastian Vettel is. Let's give the kids some credit. Um, he's a four-time world champion for a reason. And Schumacher, you already mentioned, fantastic what he achieved in Formula One. And yeah, people say the Ferrari was the best car. Sometimes in a, a few seasons, it was absolutely unbeatable in almost any era. But, and I said this then, and I'm going to say it now, it's not Mercedes' fault or Lewis Hamilton's thought that they're dominating to the degree they are. They're just doing the best job of anybody by a mile for the last seven years. It's everyone else that needs to catch up to them, not the other way around. So, you know, let's enjoy the success that Lewis Hamilton is, you know, making an achievement in the sport. Let's enjoy the success Mercedes are, because it's not going to last forever. But we certainly will be talking about it for a very, very long time and hopefully many years to come. And, uh, Let's see what the future holds. Hopefully a more competitive playing field. We may talk about these as the legend that they deserve. Um, but let's not get too sidetracked on this. We do want to talk about one final thing on this week's episode. And um, we want to sort of reminisce a little bit over the last 10 minutes or so on some of our favourite Lewis Hamilton wins. So I'm probably going to leave it to the top three, Courtney. So I'm going to ask you what you would rate your top three Lewis Hamilton wins. Do you know what? Some people might think I'm silly for saying this because, you know, this event is fresh. But I will put the race that just went in his top three. Oh, you would? And I was going to ask. This. I was going to ask yeah. you that actually. If um, I, I, yeah, I would like. So let, let's let's just put ourselves into Lewis's shoes. Yeah, okay, he's got a great lead in the championship, but he didn't have to take risks. In that race, he pretty much, you know, Bottas was behind him. He had the championship nailed. Yet, he still went out ham and tong to win that race. And the, and if you haven't watched the race, please do. The, the circumstances and the track conditions were truly exceptional. And yet, he found a way to outclass the field. Yeah, the Mercedes in the dry conditions towards the end, the, the whole car debate comes back in. But we saw, we saw a driver that has been given so much hype. And to an extent, rightly so, in Max Verstappen, even he struggled in those conditions. And yet you saw Lewis Hamilton, the guy that everyone keeps on saying, is only because of the car. He really did excel. And, you know, to an extent, we saw the same with Sebastian Vettel. Like that, that race did highlight for me some of the most, you know, able drivers. It really if did. If the cars were yeah. a bit more equal. So... Mm. I am. I'm definitely going to put Turkey in the top three. 
It really did. I'm glad you brought that up because I was just about to say um, it really was a race where we saw who we thought the top drivers in the sport are right now. And that's obviously Lewis himself, Sergio Perez definitely belonging up there, Carlos Sainz, Charles Leclerc, Sebastian Vettel. You know, a few guys, obviously, you know, incidents happened that weren't their fault, like Daniel Ricciardo probably would have done a better job. Um, or maybe Ocon, we would have seen a better job from him as well. But yeah, in that particular race, I do agree. Um, it's hard because I, I want to put it in my top three, but I think you have. So I think I'll probably leave that for now. But um, <laughs> yeah, it definitely was a brilliant drive. I know people saying, is it Lewis's greatest drive? I'm like, no, no, not for me personally, but it's certainly up there. Um, but what about the other two? Oh, you know, I, I personally believe that some of Lewis's drives came in his McLaren days. Mm. You know, I feel that oh, I might... I might go with, do you know what? I'm going to, this might seem like a really random one, but again, I'm going to give a little backstory to this. Now, in 2017, okay, Ferrari were a lot closer to Mercedes than a championship opinion actually suggested, okay? So in most of those races, the general pattern of that season was that Mercedes easily had the fastest car over one lap. But generally speaking, on a Sunday, Ferrari were often level, if not sometimes even better than the Mercedes. So we went to Spa, 2017. Lewis, of course, put, put the car on, uh, on pole. And then behind him, you had Sebastian Vettel in a faster Ferrari. Now, the, the track specifics of Spa is a very power-sensitive circuit, and it's almost impossible to defend along that that long straight. It's one probably one of the most difficult places on the calendar to defend. Yet Lewis placed that car and charged that battery perfectly around the track and knew exactly when to deploy it to keep Sebastian Vettel behind him. And that was one that was one of the races where really that should have been a, a win for Seb. And yet Lewis held on. And for me, that's another example of Lewis excelling given the machinery that he had. Mm. No, no, absolutely right. And uh, I mean Seb did get him the year afterwards in the same circumstances, but he did it much early on. But I think we don't appreciate in Formula One that often the defensive driving skills of certain drivers, certain races. I mean, we talked about Senna holding back Mansell in 92 in Monaco, um, Alonso Schumacher in Imola 2005, you know, that those sorts of performances and the defensive driving, how good they are um, and how good they have been to watch as a fan. It's like, when you watch football and you just admire a defensive performance of a team, a structure that are being bombarded by attack, 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 attack. And, and as you mentioned, Lewis Hampton had that experience in Spa 2017 and it was a brilliant drive. So yeah, I absolutely agree. It was a fantastic performance. So what is your number one? And I think you and me might have now, the same on this one. Yes. Oh, Silverstone 2008. What an incredible mm. drive for Lewis. What an incredible drive. And, and those things to the day, 12 years onwards, changeable conditions, horrid, horrid conditions. Most of the grid was spinning. You know, even the top drivers, you know, including Felipe Massa had a horrible time. I think Felipe Massa must have spun at least half a dozen times in that race. And that was the main rival to Lewis. Mm. And I think he won by over a minute, didn't he? He did, uh, yeah. I don't know if I remember. He, lapped he won by over every, a minute. He lapped everyone, but I think the top three... Or top two, something like that. It's ridiculously, I mean, yeah, and yeah. you know, and that's. I'm pleased that we kind of put another wet race into it because whenever it rains, Lewis is the rain master. I even remember when he was competing with Nico Rosberg that they'd look close, and then the moment it rains, he'd make Nico look silly. But in, by going back to 2008, it was simply an incredible drive, and to this day. It is still my favourite, Lewis. It, it gives me goosebumps still thinking about it. Mm. Yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely my favourite. Um, yeah, you know, it was an incredible performance from Lewis Hamilton. I, I remember that race like it was yesterday. You know, the start when Heike Kovalainen and put it on pole position. His teammate, you know, did a good job in that car. Ferrari obviously nipping at their heels. Kimi Raikkonen, the world champion at the time, and you know that move into Stowe Corner when it goes up the inside of Heike to take the lead. The crowd go absolutely bedlam. And this was the old Silverstone layout as well, not the new one that we're used to, you know, and it was just so 
difficult to drive on the conditions were changing it was absolutely pouring down and Lewis made a key strategy choice to stay on the intermediate tires rather than go on the wet he took the risk and it paid off massively it was so much faster and he even lapped Kimi Raikkonen the world champion at the time uh, just on pure pace and merit to the point it yeah still my favorite and best performance from Lewis Hamilton by a mile uh, and literally he won that race by several country miles and it was a fantastic day for British race and also to herald a new hero um, into the sport. You know, this young gun that was the the rookie of the rookie of the year, almost world champion in his rookie season to come back after that close, close call, nearly winning the world championship and to just put in the performances that he put in and then go on to win the world championship that very year just culminated in the euphoria and the crescendo of noise that the British fans were, you know, making when they were getting behind. It was just fantastic to watch as the sun was sort of rising and glistening on the spray and everything else. It was just an absolute sight. And if you haven't seen it, if you're a bit of a younger fan that probably doesn't remember that the way that Courtney and I do, definitely watch it back. It's a fantastic performance. and one of the best pieces of driving you'll see from any driver in any era, especially for one so young like Lewis. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I suppose the two other races, obviously that was my number one as well, guys. Probably should have done this free, free, two, two, one, one. Um, but uh, I'll talk about the other two in particular just briefly. So I think my number two Lewis Hamilton performance was in Austin 2012. Now, this was back in the McLaren as well. This was in the height of the Red Bull dominance. And the story was Sebastian Vettel versus Mark Webber versus Fernando Alonso in the Ferrari. Now, the interesting point with this race not necessarily from Lewis or the Red Bulls, but this was the race where Felipe Massa, the Ferrari driver, had outqualified his teammate Fernando Alonso, and they were on opposite sides of the grid. Now, Alonso was starting on the dirtier side, Massa was on the cleaner one. What Ferrari did, and I'll never forget this, Ferrari broke the seal on Massa's engine, and there's a seal on the engines that basically have to be maintained in part firm A conditions. On the grid, they broke the seal on Massa's engine in part firm A conditions, which resulted in Massa getting a, I think it was a five place grid penalty, which promoted Fernando Alonso upper space so he could start on the cleaner side of the track to get a better start. I mean, talk about giving your driver every bit of advantage that they could to win a world championship. Ferrari are definitely the kings of that. They will do anything, literally anything, even detriment their own drivers, I've just mentioned, to try and win a world championship. Ultimately, it was unsuccessful, but definitely got to give them credits for trying. And the race itself, obviously, you know, transpired. Hamilton got a poor start because he was starting alongside Vettel, got passed by Mark Webber. And Kimi Raikkonen in the Lotus was hot on his heels. And the race was, it was a real cat and mouse race between Vettel and Lewis Hamilton. The first time we really see these two lock horns um, in equal circumstances, it must be said, and Lewis bit by bit in that race was catching Vettel, who was clearly in a much faster car, but for whatever reason, couldn't get it round the Austin circuit the way Lewis Hamilton did, to the point where Lewis eventually got within the DRS of him, and it took so long to get there, but he had that one opportunity down the long back straight, and he got Vettel when he passed him, went to win that race. For the sheer suspense and drama of that race, the amount of effort and quality Lewis had to put in over a long period of time in that race to catch Vettel and then pass him because bear in mind if he'd made one mistake Vettel was gone he'd have checked out and won it was almost a flawless performance for Lewis to win that race and he had to be and then some to win and uh, you know it was a brilliant race for me and you know number three Germany 2018 purely for the drama of the race starting 14th on the grid because he had the fuel flow issue in qualifying that prevented him from getting into q3 started 14th on the grid and you know what happened happened the race the safety car the wet weather the in 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 call on the radio from bono if you remember that radio call when lewis stayed out instead got confused there and then of course sebastian vettel the world championship leader riling from that victory at silverstone putting it in the wall in front of his own crowd absolute nightmare seems to him and Lewis coming all the way from the back taking advantage of the conditions taking the risk changing onto the drier tires really putting pressure on his rival which culminated him winning the race for Mercedes which was you know an incredible performance and I believe to be the real catalyst in what led to Lewis's charge and Vettel's demise in that season which resulted in Lewis Hamilton winning 
his fifth world championship when the battle between those two really, really did hot up. We really got to see that rivalry at its best. It's just such a shame it never panned out um, a bit better for Sebastian and Ferrari nonetheless. But those are my top three. And uh, I think, Courtney, it's probably, unless you've got anything more to add, that's probably a good way to, uh, to end the episode, I suppose. Yeah, you know what? That was a really enjoyable uh, second half of the uh podcast in particular and I hope I hope you guys um enjoyed listening to our opinions hope hopefully you know brought back some memories of some of the older fans mm, definitely um, but yeah, yeah I think I'm I'm gutted that I forgot about Germany 2018 now could I forget about Germany 2018 that one for me personally was a great moment it wasn't for you I remember whatsapping you and mocking you about that when it happened I, I, I couldn't contain myself I had to go to someone Adam and unfortunately it was you but God, what a crazy race that was I mean I, I I was almost inconsolable I remember I was like the German fans that have gone there and you'd expect German fans to think oh yeah they support Mercedes but no German fans they supported Ferrari because of the connections to Schumacher the supporting Vettel who I don't as Sebastian Vettel I don't think he's won in uh, at Hockenheim and I might be wrong. Again, fact check me if uh, if I'm wrong on this, but I don't recall if he has or not. And, you know, it got so close. It seemed like it was in his hands. Ferrari messing about with the strategy calls, not telling Kimi to let him through because it was holding Seb up. And he had to go so much faster to, you know, recoup that time he lost because Lewis Hamilton was chasing him down, putting that pressure on him. And then obviously it ended up in the barrier. It was a nightmare watching that moment when Crofty was on on commentary out of nowhere Sebastian Vettel's Ferrari is in the wall and he's literally head in hands inconsolable and that was a man who looked you know was on the verge of winning his fifth world title and it just completely capitulated in front of him but as I said we're digressing a little bit on this one but um yeah I think that's a good opportunity to call the end of this episode guys so thank you very much for tuning in hope you enjoyed this episode as we said already make sure to check out the last episode episode 40 which is doing so well let's see if we can get that to 1000 views and let's try to get to 100 subscribers before the end of the season you know we were hoping by the end of the year but let's get it to the end of the season and we might have a little reward for you guys coming up very very soon but uh, in the meantime make sure to like share and subscribe to the podcast on YouTube and also follow us if you listen to us on your favorite podcasting platform as well and make sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram you can see the uh, directories and the handles are there as well and also Facebook and YouTube so once again guys thank you very much for tuning in stay safe and we'll see you in the next episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast <laughs>